All right. Thank you, Drew. And Bethany is going to be passing out. It's not a study guide. It's a timeline of the ministry of Christ as recorded in Luke. <clears throat> Down here is uh, all of Luke's references in red. And up here it references uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we'll go, we'll right go over here, that. Right here is Luke. There is Luke right there. So we have a prop tonight. A real life breathing prop. Um, so she's going to be passing those out. And we will get started. So while she's doing that, can anyone tell me why Luke is the most important book in the Road to Emmaus series? Because it's in the book of Luke, the Road to Emmaus is in the book. The Road to Emmaus is in the book of Luke. It really is. You could say it's the most important because without the book of Luke, we would not have the Road to Emmaus passage. And so we wouldn't be doing the series. We could do this series, we just wouldn't call it the Road to Emmaus unless somebody else would have covered it. Um, and that is the account, like we've been saying, of where Jesus met those two, road, uh, two men on the road to Emmaus and told them how the Old Testament, all of it, he said all the law and the prophets, they point to me that in this story of redemption, after the fall of man in Genesis 3-6, it's less than 10 verses later where we start to hear that first few notes of the hero theme. In verse 15, where he says that a man is coming that will crush the serpent's head. A savior is coming. A man is coming. A hero is coming. And that's the main point of the Old Testament, to proclaim he's coming, he's coming. And we hear that theme swell time and time again with the flood, with known his family is saved in the ark from the wrath of God, and that ark represents Christ. And if you're in Christ, you're saved from the wrath of God. We see it when God makes the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, when God is the flame and the pot. He passes through the, the split carcass of the animal, saying, if the covenant is not upheld by either side, let happen to me what happened to this animal. Testifying what Christ would do. Over and over and over, in the Old Testament, we see it proclaimed, He's coming, He's coming. And then that hero theme swells here in the Gospels and proclaims that He's here. He's here. Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. He's here. And even as He's ascending, He no sooner gets out of sight than an angel comes back. And what does the angel go back to saying? that was said in the Old Testament. What does the angel tell them about Jesus? Anybody remember? He's coming. He's coming. In the same way that you saw Him go, He's coming again. And from Acts on, that proclamation starts back of He's coming again. Awaiting that final swell in the hero theme where it will crescendo throughout all of eternity after every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we find ourselves in space and time tonight a couple thousand years after Christ was here. And who knows how long until His second coming. But we can be assured that He is coming back because He promised He would. But tonight in the Gospel of Luke, we'll go back in time and see through eyewitness, eyewitnesses of when Jesus was actually here on earth as Emmanuel, as God with us, the God-man, the man for us. So let's turn to Luke uh, chapter 1 in our Bibles, Luke chapter 1. And can someone read the first three verses for me? Someone read it very loudly, please. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Lydia will do it. Go ahead. First three verses of chapter 1 of Luke. Luke. 
insomuch may have undertaken to complete the narrative of things that have been accomplished among us. Just as those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministries of the word have delivered them to us, it seems good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time, passed to write an orderly account of you, most excellent Theophilus. Thank you. That's a, that's a weird name, isn't it? Um, so here he references those eyewitness accounts and gives his purpose for while he, why he's putting all this together, and that is to give an orderly account. And if you look at Luke and the book of Acts, which were both written by Luke, he does a very good job of giving an orderly account. And he also says in there, and to tell of the things accomplished, or as some versions say, all the things that were fulfilled among us, which is what we're looking at in this series. How did the Old Testament point to Christ? And how did he fulfill it? And so about Luke, I think one of the reasons he was so um, qualified to give an orderly account is he was a physician, he was a doctor, so he was a, a learned man, although I'm surprised if he actually wrote it, they could read it because of, you know, how doctors, yeah. Um, he was not a Jew. He was a, a Gentile, a Greek physician. Um, and he covers in more detail than the other gospel writers about the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus. So let's skip to verse 39 through 55. I'll read this one because it's a... Um, it's a long passage, and I'm going to interject in between it. But what has happened up to this point is the angel has appeared to Mary and to Zechariah. Zechariah was the, the high priest that year, and when he went into the Holy of Holies to do his priestly duties, he was confronted with by an angel. And the angel said, you're going to have a son. He's going to be the one that was prophesied to make straight the path of the Lord. Um, his name's going to be John. He's going to be um, a prophet. And, and of course, you know what the angel Gabriel um, said to Mary, that she was going to have a son, and they would call him Jesus. He would take away the sins of the world. He would be Emmanuel, all of that. So <clears throat> this tells about Mary's going to meet with Elizabeth. So both of them, Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist, and Mary is pregnant with Jesus. Verse 39 says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. So here is John the Baptist in the womb and it said that uh, the angel told Zechariah that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. And he's leaping at the presence of Christ. So you could, you could say this, I think. The first person to recognize who Christ was, was an unborn child. Emphasizing the fact that you don't need to see physically to see who Jesus is. John would recognize Jesus by the same means that anyone has ever recognized who Jesus truly is, and that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Later on, Jesus would ask Peter, and he would say, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus did not say, good job, Peter. You're so smart. You figured it out. You figured out who I am. All these other people, they just can't quite grasp it, but you did. Good job. That's not what he said. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. He recognized Jesus the same way that John recognized Jesus, and it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you are here tonight and you have placed your faith in Christ and believe Him to be the Son of the living God, that is a work of of the Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, finishing up in verse 41, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed with a loud cry, 
Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. All right, this next section we're going to read. How many of y'all know what the Magnificent is from Mary? Have y'all heard that before? The Magnificent? Well, we're about to read it. And it's Mary's, um, it, like her and Elizabeth are just having a great time of worship here. Uh, the babies are leaping in their wombs. They're being filled with the Spirit. They're having exclamations of praise. Elizabeth just did. And now Mary is about to make this exclamation of praise, this prayer to the Lord, recognizing what He's doing. Now, I want you to think about this. Do any of y'all know about how old Mary would have been here? I guess. Fifteen is a good guess. I would say no older than seventeen. Most likely 15 to 16, possibly even 13 to 14. Okay, so let that sink in. As, as we're reading through this, let that sink in. Somewhere between 13 and 17, this little Jewish girl, and this is what she said. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold... From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his offspring forever that from a 14 15 16 year old girl God had already worked greatly in her heart she loved the Lord and had a a knowledge of who God was and I want to challenge each of you in this way just because you're young doesn't mean that you shouldn't know something of God and who He is and of His Word. We should know something of how to pray, how to worship, how to give an answer of the hope that lies within us for anyone who would ask. To be ready to be greatly used of the Lord. I thought when I was reading through this, I thought of, um, do y'all remember, y'all weren't alive when this happened, but the, the Columbine... Uh, shooting that happened. It was years ago. Um, was that the late 90s? Early 2000s? Late 90s, I think. The Columbine shooting. It was this high school. And a shooter came in and shot up. And it didn't happen as much um, during those times. But there was this high school girl, Cassie Bernal, who woke up one morning thinking that she was just going to go to school And it was going to be a normal day. And all of a sudden, a shooter comes in. He's standing before her. And he says, do you believe in God? And she says, yes. And he killed her. She had no idea waking up that morning she was going to die as a martyr that day. Mary had no idea. She's a little Jewish girl, a 15-ish year old Jewish girl. She had no idea before Gabriel came to her that she was going to be carrying the Savior of the Lord in her womb. So, God chooses whom He will and when He will to do what He will. And we need to be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within us. So it's usually Luke's account of the birth of Jesus that we read at Christmas time. And chapter 2 opens like this. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And just like that, we're ready to pull out the candles. Let's have the candlelight servants. It's Christmas Eve. Um, It just puts you in that mood. 
uh, Luke is also the only gospel writer to tell of Jesus being circumcised. And again, this would have been a medical procedure, him being a doctor, you know, but that was not, the, the medical significance was not what the significance was of that. It was that Jesus fulfilled all the law. Like it said in the opening verses, that he fulfilled all the things that, um, the things that have been fulfilled among us. And so Luke there again is giving us a very detailed, orderly account of all of those things. All right, let's turn to Luke 3. And if someone could read 3, 21 through 22. Luke 3, 21 through 22. You can read that. Aiden, thank you. So this is the baptism of Jesus. So he goes straight from the baptism into uh, the temptation. And then after that, his ministry starts. And we'll look at that more in a minute. But this is his baptism. And it says, The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. And this was the Father. He said, You are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. God the Father is pleased with Jesus. And if you want God to be pleased with you, it will only happen one way. If you are in Christ, if you are in His Son. At the beach when uh, I taught on uh, the vine and the branches, I'm the vine, you are the branches. The Father is the vine dresser. And we talked about how everyone, every a, a branch is connected to the vine. It is vitally connected to the vine. We are connected to Jesus. We are vitally connected to Jesus. And the gardener, the vine dresser, he loves all those who are vitally connected to his son because he's pleased with his son. He loves his son more than anyone. So it's only if we're given the righteousness of Christ that's the righteousness that God is pleased with. Verses 23 through 38 cover the genealogy of Christ, his ancestry. So in Matthew, it goes back to Abraham. Uh, but here in Luke, it goes all the way back to Adam. And I don't know if this is the reason he did it, but there again, Luke is not a Jew. He's a Gentile. And it, it could be um, he's the only uh, gospel writer that's not a Jew. And it could be that he wrote this kind of signifying that Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He came for his people from every tongue, tribe, and nation from Adam on. All right, now we're going to look at, if you want to pull out your slide here, and we're going to kind of go through that a little bit. Bethany found this and printed this out for me. Um, and I think it's, a, it's color coded. Isn't that good? Ours are black and white. They're black and white. Mine's color coded. Sorry. Yeah. Bad. Did you? I forgot. About okay. Well, I was going to brag on her, and I'm going to go <laughs> brag on her anyway. When you see me up here teaching, um, God gave me an incredible help me in my wife. And so when you see me up here teaching, she has done so many things. Not like just this. If I have a slideshow, it's, she's done it. If there's something like this, she's done it. Um, she, she is very, uh, whenever I've got a, a lesson coming up to prepare for, she gives me space and time to get away and pray and study. Um, she gives me a sounding board that I will bounce ideas off of. Hey, do you think this is... Um, do, do, do you think this communicates accurately the truth of what, of what this passage said? Or does it communicate it clearly? Or um, anything like that. She does so much. So credit where credit is due. I'm standing up here, but um, I think the old saying goes, behind every good man there's a great woman. I'm not sure if I'm a good man, but she's a great woman. And I appreciate her. So um, on this slide... If you look in the middle section here, this is all the, 
the red notations there are Luke's references, that this is just what happened in, in Luke here. Up here you've got kind of all the, the Gospels represented. But you can see it's broken down into five sections. You have the prelude to Christ's ministry, which covers up until basically what we've covered, except for the temptation of Christ. He leaves his, um, his baptism and goes directly up to be tempted, and he's there 40 days and 40 nights. And, um, and then he has his first miracle. And I like this chart, how it broke it up, spring, summer, fall, winter. So that would have been a nice spring wedding in Cana. Um, where he turned the water into wine. That would have kind of kicked off his ministry. Um, you also, and, th and then you have the cleansing of the temple, Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, um, the rejection at Nazareth. Uh, and, and one thing, I didn't, re that the timeline helps me because I didn't really realize, I guess, that it was so long between his first miracle and the 12 disciples being chosen. If you see that in the middle in the winter, there, that's basically uh, almost a year has gone by from his first miracle and kind of the start of his ministry until the 12 disciples were chosen. And then um, the bulk of his ministry there um, is kind of in that ministry of, of Galilee section. But in... Um, down here at the bottom, where it says, or in the middle, it says the final journey to Jerusalem. And in chapter 9, verse 51, it says this, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face towards Jerusalem. What was he setting his face towards Jerusalem for? What was he anticipating? The cross. The cross. And so we sing it um, in a song called Grace Alone. Um, you left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost, but Jesus, your face was set. That's what it's in reference to is Luke 9.51 where it says, He set His face towards Jerusalem. It, thinking about that, humanly speaking, um, has there ever been anything that, like, you've dreaded, like getting your wisdom teeth cut out or this or that? And really, up until the few days before, you, you really don't hear much about it from Jesus. He set his face towards Jerusalem. He knew what he had to do, and he set his face to do that. Um, as it goes on through, you can see the... Um, prelude to Christ's ministry, his ministry in Galilee, and then the final journey to Jerusalem, which is about a year and a half, and then the uh, Passion Week, or sorry, not a year and a half, um, but all these represent almost a year, and then the Passion Week, which was Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, the um, crucifixion the resurrection, and then this last sec section, which is the, the consummation, his ascension to glory. So that's about all of the overview we're going to do of the book. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to cover two stories, a parable and a story. Um, and I chose these, one, because they're only in Luke. So I thought I wouldn't get into trouble um, getting any of the other guys' material that are teaching the Gospels. I didn't know what they were going to pull from, and these are only in Luke, but also, also because of what they, what they cover. They cover salvation from different, uh, different aspects. Um, the first one is found in Luke 10, so let's turn there. It's going to be a familiar story, the story of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
So he wants to know, what do I do to go to heaven? What do I do to have everlasting life? Or as we would say, what, what do I do to be saved? He said to him, this is Jesus speaking, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man answered to Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And, he, and Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So is Jesus teaching a works-based salvation here? If he just told this man, if you do these things, you'll inherit eternal life. You'll have eternal life. In a sense, yes. In a sense, yes. And then in another sense, no. He's not. There is the sense in which Jesus is talking about a perfect righteousness. In order for you to go to heaven, you must have a perfect righteousness. The problem is we do not have a perfect righteousness, do we? And that is what Jesus is trying to point out to this man. Jesus is using the law to point out the man's sinfulness. He asked him, what is written in the law? How do you see it? The man's response should have been, even if he read that, those were good things to read. Yes, that's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest commandment. But he should have said, I know what's in the law and it crushes me because I can't keep it. There's got to be something else. I can't keep it. But he doesn't say that. Here's what he says, verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You can, it's like you can feel the self-righteousness of this guy coming off of the page. Um, as if to say, oh yes, teacher. I love the Lord with all my heart. That's not a problem. And I love my neighbor as myself. That's not a problem either. I just have... Uh, just this one slight question, just a slight discrepancy here. I'm sure maybe you are slightly wiser than me, can help me sort this whole matter out. Um, who's my neighbor? And that's what I hear when I hear this guy ask that question. You know who he reminds me of? Me. He reminds me of me. Sometimes even still, but certainly before the Lord saved me. I was a Pharisee, and I guess you could say I'm a recovering Pharisee, that Jesus is slowly, over time, making more like Himself and less like the sinful, dead, self-righteous, proud, arrogant, narcissistic Pharisee that I was. I'm like a guy that Jesus talked about, and this lawyer is like a guy Jesus talked about in Luke 18. I'm going to sidebar here for a minute. Um, the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to someone who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Jesus says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So when God saved me, when he caused me to be born again, he showed me my sinfulness. 
He took me from being the Pharisee to being the tax collector. So back in Luke 10, the story of the lawyer, Jesus tells a, tr a story to try to reveal to this lawyer how far off he really is. Jesus replied in verse 30 of chapter 10, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And there's a now by chance. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three, three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Of course, with a story like this, there are always practical implications and applications of this. We really are commanded to love our enemies, to have compassion on those who are hurting and in need. And at first glance, what Jesus said seems very doable. And we don't have the rest of the story to know how this guy really responded. But then you start to pick the story apart and you start to realize how extravagant it really is. So it says he bound up his wounds and poured oil and wine, both costly commodities. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and paid for his room and board, again, very costly to this man. And then he gives the innkeeper the current equivalent of $100 extra and says that he will come back and pay him if he incurs any more expenses. Plus, all of this was done by a man who would have been seen as an enemy by the one who was helping him. The Jews and the Samaritans were very much at odds with one another. And he says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Every time you see someone in need, help them this extravagantly. And then you start to, even with the story, see the impossibility of it. There's not enough compassion, there's not enough time, there's not enough money to go and do likewise every time there is someone in need. And I think that's some of Jesus' point. There is only one man who gives so extravagantly for his enemies. Only one man who would not only give his time and money to save his enemies, but left his throne of glory in heaven and demonstrated his love for us. And while we were sinners and his enemies... He died for us. And so Jesus is the hero in this story. We love to read these stories and say, I'm the good Samaritan. No. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Jesus is the true and greater good Samaritan. It is us. We were the ones laying half dead on the road. And He comes and He pays the price for our healing. This story, Jesus is testifying of himself to this man. Using the law and then testifying of himself. And that's how we preach the gospel today. We use the law and then we testify of Jesus. And that's what he's doing here. The second story I want to look at is a familiar one as well. The story of Zacchaeus. Y'all all know that story, right? You can probably all sing the song. Zacchaeus was a wee little... How short do you think he was? I mean, Jews were not real tall anyway. Um, Luke 19. Let's refresh our memories. Luke 19, 1 through 10. And so, looking at our timeline, this is right before the Passion Week. Um... 
This is towards the, the very end of Jesus' ministry. Luke 19, 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to save him. And he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So this man meets Jesus, and we're not given the details of his conversion. And we could wish that there was more detail here, that we got to hear the conversation that happened between Jesus and Zacchaeus. But like Drew said Sunday, we are given exactly what we need from this story to learn exactly what we need to learn. It only highlights a few things, and that's what's so good about it, honestly. One, it shows us what true repentance looks like. In verse 8, he says, If I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Being a tax collector, he could have used his authority to take more than he was supposed to take and skim that off the top and keep it for himself. And that was more than likely how he had gotten so rich. And that's why the people hated him. That's why people hated the tax collectors, is they were greedy thieves. Here we see him confessing that sin and repenting of it. Turning away from it, forsaking it because his eyes have been opened to a superior treasure. A treasure that is eternal, that could not be taken away. You can almost hear the joy that Zacchaeus is saying this. Unlike, again, to parallel another story of the rich young ruler in Mark 10. After Jesus told him, sell your possessions and give to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And what does he do? he, He was unwilling to do it. And it said he went away sorrowful. Zacchaeus received him with joy. So what's the difference? What's the difference between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler? Why the change of heart? What happened to Zacchaeus that did not happen to the rich young ruler? Look at Jesus' words in verse 9 and 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So we read the story and it looks like Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus. And that's how we usually spin it, right? You know, he's the one trying to find the tree, just trying to, where is he? I'm just seeking for Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus. But here Jesus said that he came to seek and save the lost. Jesus did far more than climb a tree. He came all the way from His throne and glory in heaven not to climb a tree for Zacchaeus, but to die on a tree for Zacchaeus. And He says, Surely salvation has come to this house since He also is a son of Abraham. What did He mean by that? What did Jesus mean by that? Did He mean that because Zacchaeus was a physical descendant, He was a Jew, we believe, Because he was a physical descendant of Abraham, that Jesus saved him? Is that what he means? Oh, you're a a descendant of Abraham, so I'm going to save you. No. He is referring here to him being a spiritual son of Abraham. A child of promise, as it says in Romans chapter 9. Going back to the promise that God made Abraham when he took him out under the night sky and told Abraham, look up at the stars. And so shall your descendants be. One of those stars 
was representative of Zacchaeus. And if you're saved, if you're in Christ, one of those stars that he saw was representative of you. One of my, um, my favorite old Christian artists, Rich Mullins, um, he had a song that said, Sometimes I think of Abraham, how one star he saw had been lit for me. God chose to save Zacchaeus. As it says in Ephesians 1, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. He chose Zacchaeus not only to be a physical descendant, but part of the spiritual family of Abraham. He was already born as a physical descendant. He needed, and this is the difference between him and the rich young ruler. He was already born as a physical descendant. He needed to be born again as a spiritual descendant descendant of Abraham. At some point, God calls Zacchaeus to be born again. He opened his eyes to who Jesus really was the same way he opened Peter's eyes to know that he was Christ, the Son of the living God, the same way that he revealed himself to John in the womb by the power of the Holy Spirit through regeneration, the new birth. He showed him his sinfulness. He showed him who Jesus was. And he granted Zacchaeus repentance of sin and faith in Jesus. And Zacchaeus was saved. That's the difference between him and the rich young ruler. So his repentance was evidence of, good, of God's work of regeneration in his life. And that's why Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Think about this. Jesus really does save people from their sins. Now, I know when we hear that typically, what do we think? We we think of Jesus saving from the penalty of, of your sin. And that is true. That is absolutely true. And propitiation, Christ taking God's wrath on the cross in our stead, the penalty for our sins against a holy and just God, that is at the heart of the gospel. It is true. But you cannot leave out the fact that God saves us not only from the penalty of sin. When He saves us, He saves us from the power of sin. That here's Zacchaeus who once was a slave to sin. He, want, he once was greedy, full of theft and covetousness not loving his fellow man, not loving God. He was a slave to sin. And you see that with the rich young ruler. He's a slave to it. He walks away sorrowful. He's a slave to his sin. But God sets Zacchaeus free. As it says in Romans chapter 6, you're either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness or a slave of Christ. There's no in between. Now, I want to end with a story of a guy that I work with that I have had a front row seat of getting to watch God do this very thing in his life in the last month. It's a guy that I've actually spoken to some of y'all about. And it has been the most blessed thing watching the Lord work in his life these last months. I asked him if I could share some of his testimony a couple nights ago, and he said, absolutely, I would love nothing more. And even a week or so ago, as I was studying through this, and he was talking about all the Lord had done in his life, I showed him the story of Zacchaeus and he said, that's me. That is me. And I showed him the part where it's Jesus was the one seeking him and he said, that's me. Jesus was seeking me. So, um, this guy uh, moved to Alabama about five years ago and he started dating this girl and going to church with this girl. And shortly after he started living in an immorality with this girl. And they, um, in the last five years, have lived together and had two kids together and have not been married. And all the while going to church 
and talking about the Bible and claiming to be a Christian. And um, we've talked about the Bible a lot um, over the last few years. And finally, it's just a growing uh, concern for me that I needed to confront him about his lifestyle, that he was walking in darkness while proclaiming to be in the light. And so we talked for an hour or so one day, and I just showed him from the Bible. I didn't judge him and say, you're this, you're that. I said, here's what the Bible says. This is what it says you are. Here, do you see that? I love you. I care about you. I care about your eternity. Do you see this? And he couldn't really give me a straight answer. He came in the next day and said basically that he thinks he's good. He thinks he's, you know, he thinks he's good. So I said, okay. So that did kind of set in motion some um, God. I, I think God, you know, God works the ground and tills the ground of the hearts, preparing someone to receive the seed of the new birth to be born again. And, and I think that's been going on with him for a while. And um, it did make him think, well, I, I need to make this right, kind of humanly speaking. He was like, so I, I need to go get an engagement ring and I need to go ahead and propose to her at some point and, and get married. And uh, about a week before he was planning to propose to her, um, she comes and confesses that she has been unfaithful to him. And his whole world falls apart. He goes and gets the ring. He throws it at her and says, I'm done. Get out. You betrayed me. I can't trust you. I'm done. He leaves, reverts back to what he used to do, and went and got drunk and crashed at um, his girlfriend's sister's house who just so happens to be a believer a strong believer that goes to Church of Brook Hills which is a good church they, t they teach the gospel there she wakes him up in an overhung a hungover stupor the next morning and says you can crash here but you're going to church with me they go to church he hears a gospel message on Judas betraying Christ. And at first he thinks, well, I, I can relate to this. And somewhere in the sermon he realizes that she's not Judas, that he is. That he has been living for himself, living in sin without a care of who Christ is. That without a care that he's dragging Christ's name through the mud, claiming to be a believer, going to church, and then walking in darkness. And God caused him to be born again to a living hope, and he was saved. He had faith in Christ. And as we stood the next week and talked, it was like Zacchaeus. And that's why I said, this is, <laughs> this is you, because he stood there. He listed things I didn't know about him. He listed big things, little things that appalled him now that he had repented of and was repenting of. What was a sticker on the back of his truck? It wasn't that bad. It had a little bit of a bad word on it, but it wasn't that bad. And he said when he came out of the church, he saw that sticker and it disgusted him. He said, I've got to get it off of there. Now, what is that doing on my truck? And thing after thing after thing that God has granted him repentance for. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and save my friend and now my brother in Christ, Harley, at work. He came to seek and save Zacchaeus. And he came to seek and save all of his people, all of his elect, all of his bride, all of the promise, children of promise that were promised to Abraham. And if you're here tonight, if you place your faith and your trust in Christ and repent of your sin and turn towards Him, He will save you. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you so much for your power to save. That some would say it may even be a greater act of your creating power, even greater than creating the world out of nothing, of taking a sin blackened heart of stone and regenerating it into a heart of flesh that loves you and that seeks for you and that worships you, that believes in you, that repents of sin. Without you, those things are impossible, but with you, they are possible. Look, we thank you that we are saved by works, by the works of Jesus Christ, His work on the cross. And I pray that all of us are resting in His finished work. That we are not looking to ourselves for anything that we do. That we're not placing our faith even in our faith. And how solid our faith 